nostalgia, discourse, and the legend of one swirly boy to take over the world. What's up guys, this is Kimiro, and welcome to my memoirs, a series where I reflect on my favorite games. So for the Pokemon series, there's a lot to unpack. Um, with Generation 1 in particular, because I don't want these videos to take an hour and a half, I'm going to remark on their formula, the things they attempted to do in my interpretation of how they worked, and a reflection of their Pokemon, or at least quite a few of them. Um, I'm not going to go list by list, although it might seem like that. There is a clear method to this that I will get to. And, well, that, let's just get started. So in terms of technology, Generation 1's terrible. Um, it's buggy, right? It's got missing no and glitches all over the place. The balance releases they did for international cartridges and even yellow version are pretty paltry. Um, the theme of powerful types was good in theory, but they really didn't care about their numbers. It was pretty bad in execution. The PvP battle system was added last minute um, because people actually started taking it competitively. And there's a crit bug. Actually, there's a lot of bugs in the battle system but the crit one in particular makes it especially unbalanced. So that's it for the first point. Uh, the second point, and I'm not going to rag on every single generation, just wanted to make sure um, you guys knew that. The starter choice in generation one isn't unbalanced in my opinion. Blastoise seems to have the most when it comes to coverage, which is kind of symbolic seeing as water co covers the most of the world. Um, and it contests Charizard's offense, but thanks to the critical hit bug, Venusaur's got, you know, a slice of this pie as well. He's got access to most consistently powerful grass moves that completely ignore stat changes. As important as they are, they're, they're not, by the way. Um, Razor Leaf and Leech Seed to Venusaur. So there's this weird power triangle outside of, like, the type triangle. And that strategy with Venusaur, which is probably unintended but still exists, might be a euphemism for harder to use. Venusaur is really good for speedrunning the game, I guess. Um, there's firepower with Charizard, and there's outright offensive versatility with Blastoise. Outside of the starters, the rest of the Kanto decks is pretty solid, it's memorable, there's some great nostalgic points for people who can't let go and have been playing this game for way too long. And for a first deck, I'm astounded it's not a worse deck, and I'll get to them later in particular, like I said. Um, third up, the themes of genetic engineering run pretty deep in this game. There's this weird bio-horror lore. The old sprites in particular look gruesome. Mew looks like a fetus and it's Akira level powerful. We bring ancient animals from the dead using, you know, their fossils. Pokeballs come to life. We expose cute animals to different kinds of radiation and turn them to offensive war machines. Haphazardly assembled magnets seem to float off the ground. They look pretty man-made. There's a lab with journal entries of the first Mewtwo's birth. Tons and tons of science machines and facilities and outright weaponization of Pokemon, right? Like, even Porygon is an artificial Pokemon, and it exists as some sort of cyber weapon or potential. I doubt they just made it to be a virtual pet, especially coming off of whatever they were going. Um, Kanto's kind of, I don't know, it's like, there, there's this underlying darkness, it's like people playing God with these Pokemon, and it never lets up, it's thick. And I, I appreciate that subtext. It's pretty mature, all things considered, right? The story of Generation 1 is there. I appreciate they don't throw a tutorial in your face, aside from the first Pokemon battle, which you can easily lose, by the way. Something I genuinely miss is the initial, you know, the challenge taking front and center. The challenge of Pokemon, the old generations, used to be, you know, catch all the Pokemon. That's all you're there for. There's zero consequences for losing your first battle because the game wasn't about battling. It was about becoming stronger so you can catch better Pokemon. Reasonably, no one cares if your Pokemon are level 100 in Generation 1. As long as you can catch Mewtwo, you can beat the game. Team Rocket just makes that kind of hard because you can't challenge Sabrina without plowing through them. Your rival goes through the same deal, just a little faster. He's an immature, condescending douche novels about it the whole time. He's not really a villain, though. He's adversary, for sure, but not a villain. Even the Elite Four, which is the coalition of the region's strongest trainers, is just a roadblock to finishing your Pokédex because that's the prime directive of the game. The story kind of happens because of the roadblocks, but otherwise, everyone exists as a roadblock to catching more Pokémon and finishing your decks, and the last roadblock is society, I guess, unless you buy both games, you can't catch them all. It's pretty single-minded, and they found some ways to, you know, eke that 
validation out of people. It's very creative. I, I, I like that very much. It's very straightforward. It's not bland. And for the time, it was pretty expansive. You know, like, no one saw this coming. It's got a lot of elements that keep me coming back for replays. Not to mention its simplicity. Uh, with those properly discussed, let's talk bigger failures, like the ghost type. Ghost types absolutely fail. They don't beat psychic because they don't affect the psychic type due to a typo in the code, but even then, Lick is a physical move, so it doesn't matter because Gengar and its family, and even Jinx and its family, they're not physical fighters. But somehow, Game Freak was able to do other things to fix the game, like reduce the freeze rate of Blizzard and give Pikachu Thunderbolt Fly and Surf for its yellow moveset, right? Their type affinity of the ghost types, it's just, Gengar is a poison type, so it loses to Psychic. It's only immune to two types, which is normal and fighting, and those types, like normal attacks, okay, fine, but there's so many, there, there's, there's rock, and there's flying, and there's ground, and those types completely shred them if they get a hit off. There is the mysticism surrounding, can you hit my ghost types? My ghost types are mystical, they're fast, you're going to get hit, and you're going to die. There's, it's not hard to hit a ghost type Pokemon. Along with normal elemental types, um, later down the line, ghost types don't really have good defenses. I, I keep I have to wonder why this there's this pretense of ghost types being hard to hit. It's it's gimped. Like if you can hear the frustration in my voice, it's it's a complete failure. It, it's not a lot to consider all that. Dragon types are pretty badly done. Dragonite was only really good due to lack of foresight in terms of coding because rap was stupidly implemented. I mean, because of that, Dragonite can wobble anything they can outspeed, but so could Tentacruel, so that's not really a big deal. It's just that Dragonite wasn't strong because it had stacked stats and an amazing move pool. It was just good because of rap and, you know, because otherwise, you know, you, you slap Ice Beam on a fast water or fast ice type and Dragonite's toast. So Dragon types were pretty badly done. And now we move on to Poison. Poison as a danger type and psychic as a wisdom are interesting concepts that's the only way i can imagine psychic beats poison because this is the generation that introduced the most poison types from the point of view of a person who collects bugs and animals anything unknown can be poisonous and therefore dangerous but that in retrospect maybe they should have made most grass and bug types also poison because it just dragged the other half of them down in association because psychic is such a powerful type a few pokemon having the psychic type with an advantage over so many poison types makes this huge inherent balance issue that kind of indirectly makes psychic a powerful move outside of its stacked roster of psychic types people who had a psychic type in their party could plow through the game, um, especially the mid game. NPCs who often use local mons or weird Pokemon most likely had a Pokemon that was weak against Psychic or shit special defense. Psychic beats out Grass, Bug, and the aforementioned Ghost because of that, and it already beats Fighting. So alongside all the other poison types, having the wisdom to deal with that poison would negate its euphemism. That's cool, the concept of wisdom beating the potential danger right? Wisdom circumvents harm. If you know something, you won't do it if it hurts you. What isn't cool is the stat spreads of those psychics, again, being fucking amazing. And a lot of the poison types being aligned with evil or bad people in the game, they have poison types. I'm a poison user, so this is a personal bias of mine. I don't appreciate it. <sighs> Moving on, pointless Pokemon like Tangela, Farfetch'd, and Sea King, which I was going to neglect to mention, um, they don't all suck by design, but they definitely suck by practicality. They're weak, they don't play a good or proper role, they don't learn very unique moves, and, you know, being a mid-game Pokemon, if they were even accessible during whatever amorphous mid-game Generation 1 has, a middle-of-the-pack Pokemon is just not good. Uh, the movesets also, they're pretty god-awful. Um, highlight being just, for example, like, Magneton learned Screech at level 54, when you're expecting it to learn Thunder or something, it's kind of bad. Like, Jolteon can get double kick naturally and pin missile, but Scyther and Electrode can't learn many TMs to carry them. Um, Razor Wind has existed forever, and it's always been a useless move, honestly. I, I don't know why so many Pokemon can learn that one. It highlights that not every Pokemon was built for coverage situations. Like I said, Scyther and Electrode pretty much suck in that regard. And the inconsistency from species to species so is a bit of favoritism. I don't I, I just think it's a little unfair. Pokedex entries 
should have avoided real world par parallels and things like that. Um, referencing the real world in game, real world in game in retrospect is pretty bad. They should have kept the world fictional, and the, because of that, the the Pokedex really just seems like the fantastical entries of a young imaginative child at best, or just outright lies at worst. And lastly, for something that I consider almost purely negative, is using bugs as an evolution teaching mechanic. Because um, it's kind of confusing, it happens too fast, and bug types are very, very, very weak as a result of it. Even in Generation 1, where there's Scyther and Pinsir, they're god-awful, they're terrible. It should, ne it should have never become a tradition, because now we have the bug type is the weakest Pokemon type, and there's so many low stat based total bugs. And and also bugging and poison beat each other. So there's this weird confusion happening with the typings, and it kind of makes sense because a lot of bugs can be poisonous. If bugs eat other bugs and use poison to kill other bugs, it would make sense that bugs and poison went together and that bug would be weak against poison. And bugs that were stronger than other bugs were immune to the poison of weaker bugs. So bug also poison also beats bug. Oh god, that sounds confusing. Maybe it just sounds like they flubbed it. Let's just and let's just go with that. And lastly, the formula of every Pokemon generation, or at least how it is going to end up. So this section for the reflect for the memoirs reflections part. We're going to go through each Pokemon set. Um, that is that is the types of Pokemon that exist in that. So there's starters, there's your local cannon fodder, your electric rodent, your native bird, any fossils, any resonant cats or dogs, a plain fish, evolutions, a legendary trio, a trio leader, cover legendaries, pseudo legendary, super legendary, mystic, and any hallmark designs I can think of. Um, not every generation has every single one of them, but most generations have most is what I should say. So let's start with the starters. Like I said earlier, the starters are great. The Kanto starters are nostalgic. They're amazing by design. They're featured everywhere. Everyone knows what they are. Starters, just super duper good. The local cannon fodder, the rats. Rattata and Raticate are just rats. And Raticate is especially fat rat, but they are just rats. There's nothing to say about them. Um, back in the, well, I guess there is something to say about them. They did get Super Fang, but no one cares because no one cares about Super Fang. The Electric Rodent, Pikachu's face is probably more famous than Hello Kitty. Don't quote me on that, but Pikachu is probably the greatest Electric Rodent, like in terms of popularity, even though my favorite is something else. Um, the Native Bird, or Birds, I guess, Pidgey and Pidgeot's family and the Firo and Spiro family. They're birds. Um, Pidgeot is very beautiful. Fearow is very rough looking. I can see where they were going for a dichotomy there, but it's not very spectacular. And also, they're both god awful right now. The fossils. <laughs> um, Twitch plays Pokemon notwithstanding. The fossils are really good. Um, the dome fossils, Mystic. Kabutops looks amazing. The Helix fossil looks really cute. Uh, Omen Knight's really cool. Omen Star is very scary, but you know, I think they were pretty well done for first fossils, especially with the um, the signature designs of very well-known fossils, like an Ammonite fossil or whatever, right? The resident cat and dog, um, I would say that's Growlithe and Meowth, and um, Growlithe's amazing, and Meowth is amazing in its own generation, but they're not. Uh, very spectacular nowadays, but I love them both, especially, um, I don't know, I, I just, no one ever has a Persian, no one ever has a Persian, and that's really cool, um, because, you know, you see a Persian, like, oh, man, look, this guy means business, he, he really likes that Pokemon, um, the plain fish, uh, Magikarp, as a plain fish Pokemon, oh, you know what, it's not Magikarp, um, the plain fish of Generation 1's the Goldian Sea King line, and they're just, they're floppers, really, they're terrible, I think they actually learned Waterfall in Generation 1, and no one cares because they're bad Pokemon and Waterfall's a bad move in that game. Don't quote me on that. The Evolutions, uh, Eevee's amazing. Its first three evolutions are amazing. There's nothing much to say about that. The Legendary Trio, um, Zapdos, Articuno, and Moltres, they are pretty good. Um, and pretty good is like middling, average, kind of, you know, like they're not bad. There's no trio leader, uh, there's no cover legendaries, which is, I mean, whatever. The pseudo legendary with Dragonite, uh, the thing is, Dragonite was designed separate from Dratini and Dragonair. Um, Dratini and Dragonair were designed by the same person, obviously, and Dragonite was designed by, I think, Kintsugi Mori, don't quote me on that. But it, no one, uh, 
Dragonite could have been better, is what I should say. Dragonite could have been better. Um, it's it's kind of big and dumb and silly, and that's how it's going to go down in history until they give it a mega evolution. Uh, the super legendary Mewtwo is probably the most signature. When you think of a powerful Pokemon, Mewtwo comes to mind, and that you know Mewtwo's in Smash. You know Mewtwo's got its own movies and mega evolutions. Mewtwo's amazing. Um, the super uh, the the Mystic. Uh, the mystic Pokemon or whatever is uh, Mew. Mew's cute. Mew's nice. Mew learns everything, so it's got a reason to be very unique. Um, it's got 100 in every base stat, which means it's very strong. Um, very strong mystic kind of Pokemon, right? And then the Hallmark Designs. This is a very ambiguous phrase. I'm going to use it for my own personal bias, but uh, Scyther is amazing. Tauros is amazing. Farfetch, I know I mentioned it earlier. I wish they had done more with Farfetch. It's so, it has so much potential, right? Um, Kangaskhan's really, really good. Yeah, I like Kangaskhan. Uh, Nita King and Nita Queen were really good for the first gendered Pokemon. Um, even though I wish they would just fuse Alliance, it would cost them a Pokedex number, but it's it's not that important anymore. They're breaking traditions. They might as well break that one. I'm probably missing some, but you know, um, this video is probably going on too long. So, all in all, I really like Generation 1. There's no past tense with that. Generation 1, despite its flaws, has so much good about it and what it's done for um, the world at large that I think Generation 1 is worth everyone's time, even now. And I don't think that should ever change. So, uh, until I don't break this promise, right? But uh, I don't know what's coming next. I don't want to do Generation 2 because I have a lot of games that I've loved for a very long time. But um, until then, you know, like I said, like, subscribe, uh, and I'll see you guys next time. Peace.